actually, Your Excellencies, uh, Excellency President Yahya Aga, I'm so pleased to be here, so pleased to be here with you to address these distinguished guests. <coughs> Dear friends, it was during my recent visit to Kosovo that President Yahya Aga made me so much aware of the reality of the lives of many thousands of women around the globe, and in particular, about the 20,000 women in Kosovo alone that are still suffering the pain and the traumas as a consequence of being sexually assaulted, violated, and tortured, and used in some as a weapon of war. I felt that although we as Maltese women were and are fortunate not to have experienced experience such heinous crimes, we cannot ignore the silent plight of thousands of women around the world. Malta being situated in a region which unfortunately, since time immemorial, have witnessed and is still witnessing wars and conflicts, and a country which is committed to peace and well-being must, as I see it, be in unison with other women around the world and in particular in our region, to stand up, join hands, and lift our voices in solidarity and against past and present atrocities that have developed into a scourge to humanity. Hence, I grasp the first opportunity to bring advocates like you together to share ideas and help raise awareness of this cruel reality. That is why I'm so pleased to see so many of you respond to our invitation to focus on this topic, which is of such relevance in today's world of increasing violence and conflict. It is only by coming together in solidarity that we can ever hope to achieve meaningful and sustainable change. For too long, our societies have tacitly accepted that sexual violence is somehow an unavoidable consequence of war, that the systematic deployment of sexual violence in furthering political ends is inescapably intertwined with violent conflict, that the growing threats faced by civilian populations to achieve military objectives is a natural part of contemporary warfare. We cannot allow these assertions to go unchallenged. There is nothing which is unavoidable about sexual violence. The moment we believe our ideologies have more importance than the dignity and the well-being we share in common is the moment we would surrender to a world without hope, a world without peace, a world that is empty of human well-being. Definitely, sexual violence is a barrier to building sustainable peace and well-being. Undoubtedly, sexual violence is a fundamental threat to international peace and security. According to UN Action Against Sexual Violence in Conflict, the vast majority of casualties in today's asymmetrical wars are civilians, and the overwhelming number of human beings who face devastating forms of sexual violence are women and children. UN agencies estimate that more than 60,000 women were raped during the civil war in Sierra Leone between 1991 and 2002, more than 40,000 in Liberia between 1989 and 2003, up to 60,000 in the former Yugoslavia between 1992 to 1995, and at least 200,000 in the Democratic Republic of Congo since 1998. On the other hand, we know that around 20,000 Kosovari women were afflicted with the scourge. Rape committed during war is a tactic of terror. It is an act of torture that disembowels populations, shatters families, destroys communities, and in some instances, artificially and coercively changes the ethnic and cultural heritage of future generations. Unfortunately, sexual violence has been dismissed as random acts of individual soldiers, but in armed conflict, 
rape is also, and often a military tactic, serving as a combat tool to humiliate and demoralize individuals, to tear apart families, and to devastate communities. Unfortunately, many a time, in times of war, armed forces use sexual violence as the spoils of war for soldiers who see the rape of women as their entitlement. Lawlessness allows perpetrators to act with impunity and leave survivors with little to no recourse. Amnesty International aptly describes the scourge as, and quote, the use of rape during times of war is not a byproduct of conflicts, but a pre-planned and deliberate military strategy, unquote. Sexual violence in conflict also constitutes a threat to public health when it is used cynically and without pity to deliberately infect women with chronic, sometimes fatal, sexually transmitted infections. Sometimes it is also used to render women from targeted groups incapable of bearing children, thereby withering entire communities other routes. Though women and girls are the primary targets of rape, we must acknowledge that men and boys may also be targeted to inflict humiliation and shatter leadership structures. A United Nations report on sexual violence and armed conflict makes explicit reference to just how ancient this disordered thinking is and for how long it has persisted. Historically, armies considered rape a legitimate spoil of war, a right to, the best, to be bestowed on the victorious, and a shame to be inflicted on the defeated. In fact, Zainab Bankura, the special representative of the United Nations Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict on the 11th April 2013, described sexual violence in conflict as, quote, history's oldest and least condemned crime, unquote. During one of the most definitive conflicts of recent memory, the Second World War, combatants on all sides were accused of mass rape and sexual abuse. However, neither the court in Tokyo nor that in Nuremberg set up by the Allied Nations to prosecute suspected war crimes recognized sexual violence as a crime. On a more positive note, the UN Security Council has led the way in these last years ushering in a paradigm shift that has fundamentally altered our approach to dealing with the scourge. At last, we have, as an international community, and also through the International Criminal Court, become brave enough to acknowledge that sexual violence is a most serious crime. We must enhance the process to transfer the stigma of this crime from victims to the perpetrators. Definitely, impunity for the perpetrators and the insufficient response to the needs of survivors can no longer be tolerated. It is an international crime, a violation of human rights, and in situations of armed conflict, a violation of international humanitarian law. The United Nations Security Council has noted that such violence may constitute a war crime, a crime against humanity, or may be indeed pose an act of genocide. Let us remember also that crimes against humanity do not require a direct connection with armed conflict. Sexual violence may increase during the socio-political unrest that begins before the outbreak of violent conflict, and its scale and severity of consequences continue well after direct conflict has come to a close. Let us think of what is happening in real time to the Azadi, Kurdish community in the Levant, the continuing suffering of the Yazadi Kurdish community has been characterized with genocide perpetrated by IS to consolidate its power and terrorize its victims. The terror group abducts women and girls who are then imprisoned, sold, or offered new recruits. The system of sex slavery is a horrific reality for thousands of women and girls of the Yazadi religious minority many of whom were captured while fleeing from violence in their homes. We cannot ignore this tremendous ongoing suffering and the incomprehensible pain, torment, and distress, distress endured by thousands of women 
as a consequence of such agonizing experiences, such as Kosovari women. Although changes in international national laws are crucial, we are to end sexual violence. If we are to end sexual violence and send a clear message of zero tolerance towards these crimes, the true change we need to embrace is far more fundamental. It touches the very heart of our perceptions about what it means to be gendered beings, to be women in relation to men within a gender binary that enforces strict conducts of codes of conduct and meaning. If women and girls are taught from an early age that our survival and happiness is linked to how desirable we are to men, then we are already victims of systematic oppression. We must shift our perceptions away from a world in which only one kind of human be being is celebrated. We must understand that in reality, our lives are far more complex and diverse and full of meaning. We must stand together to end cycles of gender violence and abuses of power. These do not only take place many miles away in war zones. Unfortunately, gender violence is also present within some of our families and communities too. It is only through education and action that we can break the taboos surrounding gender violence, whether it occurs in places of ostensible peace or zones of armed conflict. We must replace the ignorance that feeds social stigma with a knowledge born of survivors' courage and their calls for justice. The bravery of Kosovari women overcoming decades of social stigma to speak out about the sexual violence they endured during the conflict in Kosovo must inspire us on this journey. We must join their voices and ensure that political will across the world treats this subject with the urgency it deserves and with a human rights approach. If we are committed to ending the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war, then we must begin with our own attitudes towards gender and power. All of society must work together across national borders or the lines drawn by our cultural and faith traditions to unite governments, civil society, and the international community in tackling the scourge of sexual violence from a human rights approach. Sexual violence is not an inevitable feature of war. We must believe that it can be stopped each one of us has a role to play in stopping it. We can stop rape. Every individual can do their part to end sexual violence. We need to speak out and raise awareness that rape is not inevitable and can be stopped. We need to tell our governments that ending sexual violence in war is a priority and that we want them to do more to stop rape now. We need to become involved with organizations working against violence against women and girls. We need to ensure women's participation in peace efforts as it is a matter of gender equality and universal human rights and is crucial to achieving sustainable peace, economic recovery, social cohesion and political legitimacy. We hope President Yayaga and I that this forum will be an impetus for us to take up this most important matter on the agenda of the Council of World Women Leaders, where both of us are members. I must thank you for your presence here today, for your solidarity in achieving an authentic transformation of our world, and your commitment to see an end to this heinous cry of sexual violence. Finally, I hope that my reflections and President Yayaga's contribution for a most informed position will help to stimulate further awareness, thinking, commitment, and participation during this forum. I wish us, I wish us all a fruitful forum. Thank you.